Today on CityCast DC, the Eden Center, the enormous Vietnamese mall in Northern Virginia, is about to see some changes. Hector Arzate from DCist and CityCast contributor Dan Reed are here to explain what they mean. Plus, there's a new billionaire in the mix for the owner of the Washington Commanders, and it's someone with ties to the arts in DC. And Marjorie Taylor Greene is concerned about conditions at the DC jail. Why ever could that be? Today is Friday, March 17th. I'm Michael Schaefer, and here's what DC is talking about. Uh, Hector, Dan, so good to see you guys. Thank you. Good to see you. Um, Hector, uh, you've been doing some reporting on WAMU and DCist about the Eden Center, which is selfishly one of my favorite destinations for Vietnamese food and uh, groceries. Will you just explain why this place has such a sort of big totemic presence in the region and then what's going on there? So, yeah, it's like you said, you know, the Eden Center is definitely one of the most popular Vietnamese community hubs uh, in the region and probably the East Coast. It's where people, like you said, go to eat. And they also just it's where they find a piece of home and culture. It literally, uh, I think, has the old South Vietnamese flag, the yellow one with the three stripes uh, flying above it, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it does. It's a huge flag if you've ever seen it in person. Um, And it's also where they celebrate that, which is the Vietnamese Lunar New Year. And that always has a really, you know, huge crowd, lots of people wanting to come to celebrate and, you know, participate in the traditions and just be together. All right. So what's going to happen there? What's the idea? Yeah. So, uh, you know, the city of Falls Church has been working on eight different small area plans. They're looking at reinvesting, uh, you know, long term for some of these commercial areas. The Eden Center is, uh, according to city officials, one of the biggest, you know, profitable commercial areas in Falls Church. Um, So they would like to reinvest in, you know, things like improved parking spaces, you know, green space. Potentially developing like housing there in addition to other commercial buildings, uh, you know, just sort of reinvesting for, for, for the coming decades is the way that the city looks at it. So, Dan, your background is as a planner, architect, uh, urbanist nerd. Um, right now, the place is kind of an old school strip mall. Can you explain sort of what it looks like and uh, and what these kinds of changes could mean, like literally uh, in terms of what you see? Well, sure. So. Like a lot of strip malls, you know, Eden Center dates to, I think, like the 1960s. And it was your typical, like, there's a grocery store, there's a hardware store kind of places. Starting in the 80s, as Vietnamese immigrants started moving in, it not only became a hub of these businesses, but the buildings themselves started to change as well, right? And so that actually is an example of what has happened to some strip malls around the country, like particularly those in communities with large immigrant populations, Strip malls usually go in one of two directions, right? Some strip malls get scraped and redeveloped with higher density buildings and Pike and Rose in Rockville is a good example, or uh, the Market Common in Clarendon in Arlington is a good example. Others, the buildings themselves remain, but get repurposed with different uses. Sometimes it's churches, sometimes it's medical centers. There's a Walmart in Texas that became a library, for instance, right? So Eden Center is an example of how these small immigrant run businesses have actually transformed these sort of old school big box spaces into smaller, uh, more affordable places to run shops, but also like lots of little internal corridors and stuff and sort of hacking these big suburban boxes into a much more fine grained like place. Um, and Hector, I'm sure that everybody is totally psyched to have uh, professional planners come and say, we're going to take this place that you all have sort of made your own and uh, make it rational and uh, and sensible and better. Exactly. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. Um, yeah, this proposal and, you know, city officials have been very adamant that this is a proposal. They're walking the line there. And, uh, you know, this whole thing has made a lot of folks get worried about what could come from this sort of reinvestment, this sort of development that could come out of the proposal. Things like rent increases. Almost all of the business owners who I spoke to uh, do not own their building. They are all renting. Right. But so I assume that, you know, it's in everybody's interest to keep it as a hub for 
Vietnamese shoppers and uh, community members and so on, because it, it seems to be working pretty well. Yeah, everyone who I spoke to in my reporting, the landlord, uh, the city officials and business owners, everybody is thinking the same thing. You know, this is working out for them. It has worked out for a really long time. It's a very popular destination. It's good for the city, according to everybody. And so, you know, the city officials have said, you know, we don't want to lose that culture, that sense of culture. The thing that you know, activists and organizers, uh, you know, who are community members, the thing that they're concerned about is they're saying you have to be intentional about not driving people out. You know, it's not enough to say, you know, we want to keep the Vietnamese culture here. You have to do something proactive is what they're saying. I don't mean to be the like evil capitalist here, but like it's from the way you guys have described it. Nothing about this was intentional. It was like an old school 1960s strip mall full of like big, you know, Safeway or whatever, like big box stores and people kind of made it their own and they chopped it up in ways that like kind of worked for the storekeepers or for the shoppers or whoever. None of it was planned. It was this sort of magical serendipity that's made a lot of people happy, obviously members of the Vietnamese community, but also anyone who is into the food and culture and and retail of Vietnam. Are people worried that like in a redeveloped situation, that same dynamic would not be able to happen? People are worried about that. You know, uh, they've pointed to the fact that this has happened in the past. You know, in the 1970s, there was, as a result of the the war in Vietnam, there was a small community in Clarendon. You know, it was known as Little Saigon. And, you know, the construction of the metro there is what they believe led to people being priced out and, you know, forced to move out and, and actually end up in Falls Church, which is where they're at now. And Community members who I've spoken to have also pointed to D.C.'s own Chinatown. It had a long history there, and uh, they've specifically told me, you know, D.C.'s Chinatown still has a lot of the signage in the language, but, you know, it's missing something. And and that thing that they're saying is missing is the people. It's missing the the, the everyday culture, you know, the the families, you know, the, the elders, things like that. that that's what they, they fear. All right. So what happens now? I spoke to city officials and they told me that the the group that organized some of this, you know, the, the group called the Viet Place Collective, they actually did make them pump the brakes. You know, now the city is actually taking a pause and wanting to collect more information from community members. And so now they're hosting four different pop up events actually at the Eden Center. And the first one is actually happening this Saturday, March 18th. And, you know, in addition to that, you know, the group that's organizing this, they also want to continue doing their outreach. And so they've been raising funds to print flyers in Vietnamese. They've been canvassing the area and they've also just hired dozens of of people to help, you know, spread the word so that more people are aware, particularly those older generations who maybe don't have access to uh, social media and things like that. So you spent a bunch of time out there. Give us some recommendations if, if we were to visit Eden Center. Yeah. I mean, I would say, honestly, you could Hit up every single business front that's there. Um, if you if you like Vietnamese food, uh, TDM is a fun place. You know, it's where you can get boba. It's a kind of a more modern take on boba and bubble tea. Saigon Bakery, of course, you know has a lot of really great stuff. Uh, you know, bon mi's. Uh, there's just so much there. All right. Well, so. Let me just change to a, a second subject of a place that uh, I don't think any of us particularly want to go, but apparently Marjorie Taylor Greene does, which is the D.C. jail, the very conservative Georgia QAnon curious member of Congress, among other Republicans, has uh, sent a letter to the mayor of D.C. demanding to visit the D.C. jail. They claim that the January 6th inmates are being uh, mistreated there. They are in solitary and so on. This has been a recurring theme the last few years where uh, the jail has like separated these January 6 inmates from the general population. The general population is almost entirely black. The January 6th detainees are um, not. My uh, old Washingtonian colleague, Andrew Bojan, did a feature story about this. They've kind of developed their own little world in there. And they claim that the place is terrible and unfair and mistreating them for political reasons, among other reasons. Green made a previous visit to the jail. So this has become like a thing on the far right. And there's this sort of irony at the core of it, which is that the D.C. jail has historically spent a lot of time as an absolute hellhole. 
Um, and it has been a place with court-ordered reforms and decrees and so on. And uh, nobody in the Congress, as far as I can remember, cared one bit about it until these folks wound up there. I suppose I'm happy that somebody's talking about prison reform. <laughs> Well, that's but, uh, the that's the the irony of the core of this, right? I I don't know. I it it seems to beg the question, right? Like, why would these people be separated from other inmates? It it's not like they tried to overthrow the government or something. That's that's kind of a different level of misadventure than a lot of the folks in the jail, right? Who might be there for relatively smaller offenses. Well, yes and no, because <laughs> uh, the actual charges. That those folks are on are often like disobeying a police officer or trespassing, entering a place they're not supposed to enter. They are not all there on like murder charges and stuff. That said, this is rem it reminds me of like when I was first a, a reporter in D.C. and there would be some like big protest event, like a World Bank protest kind of thing. And a bunch of people, collegiate, post-college types would protest and then would get arrested and would call us afterwards and say, oh, my God, it's so terrible. The jail, it's, you know, the, the police, they treat everyone so terribly. And it may be true, but it's also that, like, when, when you suddenly have a population who aren't used to being on the wrong end of law enforcement, it's like a revelation to them. And there's a lot of other people who might be like, yeah, you know what? It's jail. It's It, it sucks. Yeah, there's a, it, this kind of speaks to a conversation I think people have had is like, well, what what is jail for, right? And like, is the point to rehabilitate or to punish? And this is sort of a little microcosm of that, right? If you believe that jail is a place to rehabilitate people, then you would be demanding better conditions. If you feel it's supposed to be a punishment, then you you might not feel that way. Well, look, it this is, place is also, I mean, these people that we're talking about are also people awaiting trial. So like we haven't judged them yet worthy of, of punishment. That's my my sense is like if a perverse side effect of this becoming a right wing politicized thing can be that the district is forced to spend the money and the energy to make the experience of people jailed less inhumane, that's a win for everyone. So thanks, Marjorie. Yeah, I'm curious. How long do these January six detainees expect to be there? Like when when will they go for trial? I I seem to get. Uh, a press release like every day from the U.S. attorney about another new person has been convicted or, or sentenced or whatever. So I don't imagine this can go on that much longer uh, without convictions. And will they be is it expected they'll be in the D.C. jail for that entire time, like until something happens? Well, one uh, one detainee is asked to be transferred to Guantanamo because uh, he said that it's got to be better than the D.C. jail. But I think right now, I mean, you, you get arrested in D.C., you go to the D.C. jail. Like, I don't think you get to, like, pick your jail based on your politics. You know, my cousin went to D.C. jail for, for three days after an altercation a couple of years ago. And he is a bright kid who had never gotten really in trouble before. He's a skater professionally and describe it as a really awful, scary place, like terrifying. And part of that, you could say that's that's just jail. And part of that is like. Like a lot of these folks who are there now because of January 6th, this is not a place they've experienced before. I would hope it encourages some empathy. And I would honestly hope, not unlike my cousin, maybe maybe they'll be uh, discouraged to pull that nonsense again. All right. So uh, there's been news uh, on, uh, on another front this week, uh, which is that there's a new person, a new name in the mix for owner of the Washington Commanders. And it is Michelle Rails, who is, among other things, he's the guy behind the Glenstone Museum in Montgomery County. Dan, what do you know about this guy? So, uh, well, first of all, have you been to Glenstone? I'm such a Philistine. I have not. <laughs> so it is this big, fancy, privately owned modern art museum in Potomac. It started out as a really small gallery about 25 years ago. And then a few years ago, uh, Mitchell Rails did this massive expansion where it's now one of the largest museums in, in the region, right? Largest privately owned museum is the largest any kind of museum. And it's a place where he's displaying his collection, but also, you know, where like the you know most avant-garde of modern art is displayed in this gorgeously designed, streamlined, modern building resting in fields, right? 
And Mitchell Rells has basically been able to do whatever he wants, you know, with this property, right? He demolished an entire neighborhood of $2 million houses next to it as part of the expansion. This is the kind of money he's playing with, right? So it's not, he's not the person you normally think as uh, wanting to buy a football team. Wait, how did he make his money? I presume he didn't make it from museuming. He owned a company called Danaher with his brother, which makes a lot of things, medical research equipment, dental equipment, drill parts, all sorts of stuff. And he's he's become you know, one of the wealthiest people like in the country as a result. But he's not wealthy enough to buy the team solo. He's part of another person's uh, right. uh, bid. He's partnering with Josh Harris, who is uh, he, he co-founded an investment firm, and he also partly owns the Philadelphia 76ers and New Jersey Devils, as well as a little teeny tiny part of the Steelers. Um, and he would have to sell that part, I assume. Perhaps. Um, <laughs> it would make sense. So the, the, the kind of like conspiracy theory uh, inside baseball stuff is that uh, allegedly Snyder, the much maligned current owner of the team, really doesn't want to sell to Jeff Bezos because Snyder hates the fact that the Post, which is owned by Jeff Bezos, has done so many mean-spirited stories about him, in his view. And uh, bringing Rails in to this Josh Harris bid, a, a, a you know guy who owns teams in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, kind of adds a hometown frisson to that. It probably also adds some dollars to his mix. And makes it like a uh, maybe a, a more acceptable thing for Snyder to, to stiff uh, one of the richest people in the world. It's a it's a neighborly thing, right? You know, I might go to my neighbor's house to borrow a cup of sugar. You know, uh, Mitch Rills and Dan Snyder live down the street from each other in Potomac. They say, "Hey, let me let me sell you my football team." Um, well, what do you think about this? Would it, like can you prognosticate about what this would actually mean for either the team or for the fans or for the city that is obsessed with uh, the the soap opera that they are? If there's one thing I've gleaned from visiting Glenstone is that Mitchell Rails and his his wife, Emily, who also you know, they co-founded the museum, they are very interested in creating an experience, right? Glenstone is a beautiful environment. Everything from the, the details in the building to the uniforms that the staff wears is like very heavily curated. And so I'd like to think he would apply that to the experience of fans, whether it's, you know, what is it like going to the stadium? Maybe maybe not charging people to walk there because they didn't want to pay for parking. Um, wait, so listen, uh, are, are you saying that if uh, he bought the team, we might not have a pig shaped new mascot? I would hope that a uh, major Tutty might be replaced by a more... Well, ultimately, a more beautiful, visually appealing mascot or in the gritty vein, uh, because this is a modern art museum, you know, uh, something chaotic and ridiculous and exciting. One of the most like iconic sculptures at Glenstone is this thing called Split Rocker. It's a giant rocking horse covered in plants from uh, Jeff Koons. He's the guy who makes those uh, big chrome balloon animals. That's what I'm anticipating. A rocking horse, a giant chrome balloon animal. Anything could be better than Major Tutty. I think that'll go over very well in the NFL. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, thank you guys very much. And as always, we will end with a DC life hack. Today is St. Patrick's Day, and that can mean a lot of alcohol consumption. A nonprofit called the Washington Regional Alcohol Program has set up a sober ride system just for today. They'll post a promo code on their website at three o'clock and anyone in the DMV can enter it into the Lyft app for a free ride up to $15. The program works from 4 p.m. to 4 a.m. Be safe out there. Hector, Dan, I hope you guys are safe out there too. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Thank you for having me. And that is all for today here on CityCast DC. Our lead producer is Priyanka Tilve. Our producer is Julia Karen. Our newsletter writer is Kayla Cote Stemmerman. And our hosts are Bridget Todd and me, Michael Schaefer from Politico. Music is by Alex Roldan. If you enjoyed the show, why don't you take a copy of the logo and put it on a football helmet? We'll be back Monday morning with more news from around the city. Bye. Bye.